Do you want to break the code of history and be prepared for VUCA environments? Hi, my name is Ron William, Development Director at the Foundation of the Study of Cycles. Welcome to our FSC TV, where we feature an interview based on the book themed Breaking the Code of History by David Murren. A few highlights on our guest. David explored jungles of Papua New Guinea, working on oil exploration many years ago, before working for a Wall Street bank and then setting up his own investment firm. His own ideas are based on models for understanding societies, geopolitics, and markets in order to make returns for himself and investors. Look out for the educational references to technical analysis methods such as the edit wave theory, long cycle framework of the contractive wave, and how all of this impacts markets, society, and politics. Please subscribe to our channel, like and share any insightful comments. And finally, click on the link below if you'd like to learn more about the FSC membership benefits. Enjoy the interview. Welcome, David. Hi, Ron. Nice to be chatting to you again. Great. Uh, it's overseas, uh, UK on your side and Hong Kong here, uh, just as we cross into the new year of 2022. Perfect time to be discussing the future then. Yes, indeed. And if we could actually start with more with the backstory and uh, an outline of your career, just to set the scene uh, for our discussion. Okay, it's been fairly eclectic. I was educated in the UK. I luckily I love traveled a great deal with my father because at a time when English society was quite closed in the 70s, my father worked abroad. So we went with him. So I had very much a perspective, the world as a whole large sphere rather than just the sort of English centric perspective. And I was very much into the whole American motivation system, work ethic and reward. So I was brought up in that construct. I studied physics at Exeter University and specialized in geophysics. I knew I wanted to be a seismologist because I promised myself I wasn't going to be in the city, which is one of those great moments in life when you're completely wrong about where you end up, because I did end up doing that in the end. But beforehand, I ended up joining a company that specialized in seismic work, and our client was Shell in this case. And I was posted as a 21-year-old to the depths of the Seapik Basin, which is a pretty disgusting version of jungle because it's predominantly swamp in the second biggest river in the world. We were 500 miles from the from the coast and the river was about a mile and a half wide, full of crocs. And our operational area was about the size of Wales. We started off with 600 to 900 labor force works and managed by about 15 expats. And uh, my first day of work was a formative moment, really, which we'll come on to. After about three years there and some immense responsibilities and experiences through this bizarre route, I actually ended up working for JP Morgan as they had a, um, a program for encouraging eclectic individuals to join them. Uh, and so there are the various other people with interesting backgrounds. They put us through their equivalent of an MFP program, which is an MBA, which is a great privilege run by Harvard professors. And I quickly, as a scientist, developed a huge doubt over the validity of economics as a predictive system. Um, and then I joined the trading floor uh, and very quickly saw something on that trading floor that was similar to, to something I'd seen in Papua New Guinea, which we'll talk about in a minute. And I became determined and fascinated to be a part of directional trading and the, the, the art of predicting what comes next and trading it because that fascinated me. And it wasn't something that culturally at JP Morgan at the time was even thought of possible. Most people were spread traders. They developed their revenue through sitting in a seat and money came through them as a flow and they took a spread out of it. And sometimes they held it for longer. And a few of them were quite good at holding it and taking directional pieces out. But as a single form without the spread generation, we didn't have prop traders at that stage. And so I became one of the first prop traders, was one of the first to make money uh, actually out of the interest rate cycle in the UK, which followed a very interesting wave pattern. And um, then I was asked to go and set up a group in the UK, which is matched by great friend Drew Baptiste, who basically between the two of us, we used pattern recognition systems to change the way the bank operated right the way up to the board. 
Um, he covered the States, I covered Europe, and it was fantastic. I was privileged enough to, to see him as a second generation Elliott Wave counter and to learn from him. Uh, and that was when I started to realize as a scientist, the validity of wave counting with its fractal structures and the harmonics, which you know are really naturally occurring in Fibonacci. And as a scientist, it was really obviously something that wasn't a random pattern applied to markets. It had phenomenal appropriateness and predictiveness. And all my work to this day is predominantly based on early wave pattern recognition, more sophisticated versions, things I've modified and evolved, uh, but predominantly based out of the same process. So my relation with Drew is a great pleasure. He's a marvelous man and a tremendous exponent of the uh, of the art form. And um, I promised myself by 30, I would work for myself. And on my 30th birthday, I handed in my resignation and set up my first hedge fund. Uh, again, hedge funds in the early 90s were something most people couldn't spell, didn't know they existed, especially in Europe. Uh, it was one of the first. Uh, and from that success, we started the second one, which is based on emerging markets with my with my ex-partner. And JP Morgan was you know, the top emerging markets um, firm in, in anywhere. And I had proven to myself by basically tracking their prices of emerging market bonds that others couldn't see because they didn't have data access, that the patterns we recognized were not self-fulfilling patterns, but innate patterns to an unconscious collective market. And they were immensely successful in the emerging market world, helped JP Morgan's group make a lot of money. And we replicated that as one of the first emerging market hedge funds. And after the Asian crisis, we were number one in the world by a long shot, having picked the top and bought the bottom. And that was the beginning of a process that continued through a whole range of emerging market crises like Argentina and Russia. Uh, and we expanded outwards into every other form of macro trading. Uh, we were incredibly successful with 07 and 08. I think we're making about 84% in that particular fall um, and some other fascinating dislocations we saw that others didn't. And then uh, I stopped managing money in about 2012 because I worked out they were going to print money for longer than I could disbelieve it. And I didn't really want to be part of a trend, which I believed was part of the end and change of the world uh, as America's system of productivity was replaced by leverage through debt. So I stepped aside and built a number of different markets. I'd started building other businesses uh, the decade before when we built a big agricultural business with Harvard, the biggest in, in Southern Africa. And that was a fascinating project. And so I started to do other things like that, which were within the construct of a macro theme, individual businesses that took advantage of them. Uh, and then in 2019, I became aware that the end was nigh as far as I could see it, the printing of money had a, had a limitation. And so I decided I could do two things. I could set up a hedge fund, make money for myself. But I believe that the crisis that society was about to face through this process was so big that unless this, uh, everyone could be educated as to what we're experiencing and policies could be changed, it didn't matter how much money you'd made because we were going to lose everything in the ensuing conflict that followed with China. So I decided to set up Global Forecaster, which was has about three mechanisms that it transfers knowledge. One is through forecasting, which people can access, geopolitical forecasting, which will come on to how that works and where the genesis came from. Um, it's really in replication, a hedge fund that people can access every single aspect, the IP of why to do it, the specific trades, how to apply risk. So people can then dip in and tap into it. And that way, by education, it shows the validity of all the other ideas. And there's an, also another part called Global Strategist, where we advise governments, large corporations, and how to navigate through how we see the future and using thematics generated in the cycles we'll talk about based on the five stages of empire. Very good. And with that vast experience, I mean, predominantly in, in the finance industry and, and, and really through its evolution, what conditions, in, in addition to that, uh, laid uh, the foundation to come up with this and related theories? Put simply, why you, David? Well, <laughs> well, it's a great question. Someone answered me a long time ago, and it, you know, it, it was an interesting thought. So I think the conditions that allowed me to be someone that did this were, first of all, for some reason, I was fascinated in warfare from the earliest age. And I recognize that history was defined by the wars human societies fought. So my poor mother was reading to me about tanks and airplanes when I was two, and she thought I was mad. And that fascination with the technology involved with wars, how we fought them and why we fought them, has been a thread, a strong thread throughout my life. Um, I obviously studied physics, which and physics forces the left brain to develop a logic and rationality. And I was always dyslexic, 
which means I'm right brained. And dyslexics are very good at pattern recognition. We're not very good at spelling and we're very bad at words. And the challenge of writing books in the past 20 years has been one of the biggest challenges I've ever faced academically and had to teach myself how to do that because quite simply it was beyond me um, 20 years ago. Um, and so the combination of military history, being brought up in a family that had been linked to the Indian Empire, so history was real within our family construct, being scientific and logical in the process. And then the next step was being in Papua New Guinea and watching on my first day at work, a group of 60 Papua New Guineans with bones through their noses my on a helipad um, wanting to kill me when I suggested they should work in the rain, watching one person called Augustus, the son of a chief, brandish his machete around rather violently was alarming enough, but the, his energy spread like the ripples in a pond. And suddenly all 60 of them were resonating with this, I hate David and you're gonna die um, energy. And of course help was a hundred miles away. So there was no way you could get away. You couldn't run, you couldn't fight it. So I decided to take a leaf out of my grandmother's book as a memsarb and show no fear. And I jumped into the middle of them and I used willpower to face them down. Imagine one holding up a machete and, and I just look at them, don't you dare, don't you dare. And slowly I managed to get through this mob and walk to the other side to my tarpauling and uh, sat down to write a letter to my mother saying on my first day of work, I wouldn't be coming home because I think I was going to die. <laughs> and they regrouped because in their culture, they only attack people who run. So I didn't run. I moved into them. And so then they had another strategy where they came into the tent one by one and hit me and tried to precipitate a fight, knowing they'd all pile in. And I ignored that, uh, somewhat bruised at the end of it. But within about an hour and a half, they were all sitting around the tent like vacant emotional children after a tantrum. And what I'd witnessed is one individual's energy that charged the whole group. And that emotion was shared collectively and then dissipated like a capacitor. And what fascinated me was none of them hated me afterwards. In our society, there would be residual anger, you know, stuff that could last for years. I was following an incident like that. But they had completely discharged those emotions. And I developed this idea they had a low threshold of individuality. Therefore, they shared it collectively. And then, lo and behold, I find myself on the trading floor on JP Morgan thinking, what do I as a physicist know about finance? Time to have a look and see who I think does know. And very quickly, I worked out that these highly so-called educated economists were completely useless. It was like sort of having a witch doctor in the society. Everyone believes, but it's consistently wrong, which I find fascinating. And that's when I noticed collective behavioral patterns on this trading floor with highly educated people that were selected for you know highly you know highly good performance academically that reduced to a pocket calculator by collective behavioral patterns and that's when i thought now i need to quantify them price has to be the lever and after being doing that for about three weeks some old codger came past and tapped me on the say hey you know mate there's a whole load of stuff about that in the book somewhere <laughs> and so that was the beginning of realizing my observation wasn't unique and i started to look at other people's work and better ways of doing it and that was the beginning of my process of quantifying price and the next step in the story is along came 9 11 and i was on my trading floor we knew exactly what it was because my father had been in aviation it wasn't a failure of navigation. It was an intentional first strike. And we fared well in that very sad day. And as many people did, I found myself reflecting on the idea the world would never be the same. And that maybe it was never what we thought it was. Because what if, essentially, this wasn't an accident? This was a failure of the American immune system, i.e. its intelligence agencies, competing with each other and not sharing information. After all, they'd thwarted over the past decade a huge number of fundamentalist attacks. Why did they fail with this one? And could this process of not sharing and competition, which I hypothesized very quickly and turned out to be correct, be a hallmark of decline? So then I asked the next question, what if it is a hallmark of decline? What if the wave that's about to engulf us is bigger than the price data that we can see of 100 years of markets that would mark a collective psychology of behavior? What if it's part of a 500 year cycle? How do you work out what's coming? So the obvious answer to that was somehow or another, taking a construct based around price and allocating emotional behaviors to that process and then looking for the emotional behavioral cycle, not validated because there weren't any price patterns. And key to that, at this stage, suddenly my interest in wars started to kick in because wars are the clocks of empires. So I started to create a cycle based on the wars that people fought 
and the nature and construct of how and why they fought. That was suddenly the, the, the idea, well, hang on, there are other things we can use here to gauge a cycle, which represents something. And then I also thought about the essential construct of an Elliott wave, which is five up and three down. Well, what you really see is three impulses up and you see two impulses down. So, so let's just take out the corrections, which over history you wouldn't notice because they're going to appear very differently within a large society and look for three changes up and then two changes down. And funnily enough, when I started to look at the cycle of wars, I could see that cycle too. So I, that's when I constructed this hypothesis, which was essentially based around five stages of empire, regionalization, ascension to empire, which was an, an exponential process, maturity, which was a slow rounding off, overextension and decline. And so then I started to look, as you do, at every empire I could find. And I was flabbergasted to find all the ancient systems had similar processes. When I came to the European systems, I was a little bit shocked because the Portuguese, the Spanish, the Dutch, the French, the British, Germany trying, then America, they have much shorter cycles than 250 to you know 400 years, much shorter. So I kept thinking, this is very strange. Could it be the technology has changed the process of transference of power and USPs? And then I suddenly realized this empire that we sat in, in the West was not a national empire. It was a super empire with the meme of Christianity. And each of them was a unit within it. And they basically, but the overall system now had the same period as an old empire did, like, you know, the Roman system or the Egyptians, Greek systems. And that was a light bulb moment that actually there was a thing called a super empire, an agglomeration of subunits we didn't recognize. And of course, then I suddenly thought about the construct of Rome as the first super empire, because when, it, when Rome fell in the West, it continued in the East. And so basically, in a fractal process, it split off and created a super system that had continuity over two cycles, in effect, which is, again, another way of thinking about the organization of social systems. And so that for all those reasons, this stuff started to come together. Of course, once I pieced it together, I was a little hesitant to explain to people in 2003 that what we were witnessing was the beginning of the end of our Western civilization after 500 years of dominance and the rise of the Asian system, which when I looked at it, we shouldn't be surprised at because their first system was Japan and the Japanese empire already challenged the Western empire, starting with the Russians and, you know, in the early, at the end of the 19th century and early 20th century successfully. And then of course, failing in the second world war. And then the, the second system of China underneath it, who's been busy challenging us from North Korea onwards and, you know, and Vietnam and the involvement of it. So this idea that we were going to have conflict with this other system, wasn't really difficult when you placed into context what the conflicts we'd experience already were, the conflicts between two super systems. So again, it really started to make sense. And what was really fascinating as I refined those concepts was that once, once, what drove it. Now, um, I strongly argue that the organizational energy behind a social structure like an empire is demographics. So as demographics expand, there is a need for the system to further self-organize, become more efficient, and therefore find a way of sustaining that population. It does it by expanding. It does it by running down its resource lines. It does it by militarization. And conversely, when its demographics collapse, especially in the core of the ruling class, you can still have an overall number that's the same. But as the underclass rises, and the overclass falls, the system starts to collapse and it has to recycle itself with a new social integration and start again. And once you start to see those patterns and you start to understand the types of leadership. So, for example, on the way up, so as you move through regionalization, you tend to find a fairly, I call them iterative thinkers and lateral thinkers. So you tend to end up with iterative leadership because that process of regionalization and population expansion is quite slow. Then it reaches a critical point where there's a few people at the top with lots of everything and control and power, an awful lot of people at the bottom who don't have much. And the revolution starts by the mistreatment of a few protesters. The protesters are lateral thinkers. They're responded to by linear thinkers. And then you have a civil war which is essentially what is a regional civil war. And it's really about the transference of power from linear thinking to lateral expansive thinking, which allows that collective population to manifest the expansion they need for their social security. So by the time you end a civil war, you've militarized your society and, it, and the process of entropy is far better one led by lateral thinkers because there's nothing linear about entropy. It catches you with survivors everywhere. 
So if you think about the linear body of mankind, it's about the stability of a system. It's about the iteration of everyday processes. And leadership comes from lateral processes of thought. So all the great expansions have been led by lateral thinking across a system. An example being the Royal Navy, which led the British Empire's whole expansion, was probably the biggest lateral thinking military organization in history because the sea had shaped the requirement for lateral thinking. Even to this day, navies have more lateral leaders than the armies do because they have a more linear environment. And peacetime armies are led by linear thinkers and wartime armies have to be substituted by lateral thinkers. So from that lateral gene pool, you have leadership. And you can now see that you get to the top of the empire cycle. Of course, empires control everything. If you control everything, then linear thinking starts to work and they're far more politically connected. So very quickly, the mavericks get thrown out as you roll over the top of maturity into overextension. The system still looks powerful because it has no threats. But gradually, it loses its competitive and product, competitiveness and productivity. And more importantly, the maverick creation engine which built the thing is locked out by this political construct of linear thinking. The system becomes unadaptive and there becomes prey to the next rising system, which then increases collectively for humanity, the entropy or the ability to roll back entropy with what I call anti-entropy in a new theory, so that basically mankind controls its environment more and more with time. And we've used wars in effect to remove sequestered old empires and replace them with more vital ones through the Darwinistic process of conflict. And fascinating, that's why we have wars. We all hate them. We don't want them. We have them because they've been part of our evolutionary cycle and we haven't realized that. But we need to because they become so destructive, we can't use that method anymore. And that's why this century, this decade is so critical. And, and, and building on, I mean, all that you shared there in terms of the, the rich uh, number of factors that actually drive us to this point, at, at the pivot point of the shift, uh, when it's happening in the moment. Um, so you mentioned 9-11 as, as one of those moments of history uh, with, with truly things did change things do seem linear to some. Uh, and, and as part of this asymmetry pattern that you described as five stage um, of empire, can you describe a little bit about that moment, uh, how it pertains to a, a contrarian shift and an asymmetric shape? And then you mentioned the Elliott wave pattern as, as offering a little bit of a fractal model as well. All right. So, so, so um, in, in a, another of my theories since breaking the code of history, it's the, it's really the, the collective, a construct of a human system. And I would argue that we are designed like an ant colony. So 70% of the population have a linear thought process, which is designed to perpetuate the collective knowledge of the system and maintain its body and momentum. And essentially there's a 30% from which leadership that's expansive and creative is drawn. And half of them are only useful in a war with because they, as an IQ curve of the other 30%, they're not bright enough to adapt. So they suffer in peace terribly. But in wartime, they become your corporals and sergeants and junior leaders. And so essentially what happens is you end up with when entropy hits a system, if you're led by linear leadership, you're really in trouble because you don't adapt, you don't move fast enough, you don't create adaptive strategies. If entropy strikes a lateral system, it very quickly adapts faster than its competitors and overcomes it. So, so when 9-11 came about, America was really, Britain and Europe were really full of linear thinking. Europe's in terminal decline, it's everywhere. And, and Britain had more lateral elements, but has suppressed a lot of them. In America, they really were moving into the linear process of we're great, we'll last a hundred years, what do we do with it? And so, one of the greatest successes, if you were an Islamic fundamentalist, is whatever you thought the great Satan was before that moment, most people would have said, nah, not really. But after that moment, with rendition and torture and anything goes, strange enough, America became the thing that they claimed America was before. So the action changed American behavior under Rumsfeld and Cheney and lost the moral imperative. Now, most linear people just think, thought that was a blip. And they'll get back on the road and off we go. But if you're a lateral thinker, you realize that's not how the world works. It, it, that blip isn't a blip. It's a chasm which announced another whole phase of American history. And when it happened, that's when I was able to understand what it was and what happened afterwards. And part of that process was the printing of money. And the printing of money on an epic scale happens 
Initially, when you build an empire, but you get to repay it because the empire becomes a monopoly, therefore it pays back its debt. The second time it does it, it's actually in decline. It's not producing as much. It's slowly reducing its productivity, so it uses leverage to counter it. And that was the beginning of the of the of decline. And decline is a massive printing exercise, which we've seen in two uh, decades since. And, and and the data that that you study, David, is, is truly impressive. I and mean, we we had a brief chat uh, about the ice core uh, history and and how far back that goes, uh, but also how it you know along with a wide range of other data you look at, it does highlight these cycles over time. And just out of interest, looking back, how much of the kind of credit uh, mismanagement does show up in history as as a turning point for these empires? Well, you know, so I would argue the driver of the cycle of empires is demographic expansion and contraction. Money is a resource. So how you use your money is about the trading of one thing for your resource base that feeds your population. And there are very clear cycles. So, for example, the first debt cycle of an empire is in regionalization, expansion, but they borrow from themselves like crazy. Um, and I'm going to use this as a direct example. That's where China is. So when people look at the Chinese and say, man, those guys are really in trouble, they don't understand that they are borrowing money to invest in their USP which makes them dominant, which allows them to get to be a monopoly and essentially move to the number one slot in the world. Now, they have an equation whereby when they're destabilized by the amount of debt they've borrowed, they become even more expansive. So it's actually very threatening to hear that they they, they have a destabilized system because their only solution is to go outwards to solve the problem. And um, once they have done that, in the case of Britain and America and other systems, they then have a dominant empire that through the trading mechanism, they, if they're a global maritime system, they repay that debt and completely go back to having no debt by the time they reach the top of the cycle. But then as they move into overextension, as I mentioned to you, their productivity drops. And to compensate for it, as they meet challenges like 9-11, they start to leverage and print. Initially, no one notices it. And as a sequence of events come along and there's no adaptation and return to expansive, growthful strategies, they just keep borrowing more money to compensate for, for the drag of less productivity. And that all looks great because they're an empire and they can manipulate it until suddenly a hegemonic challenger appears. And when a physical hegemonic challenger appears, the system can delude itself that it can keep printing money. But the delusion breaks when someone pokes a bubble in the balloon, which is the external force of the hegemonic challenger. And so in this case, it's China. So when people make parallels of America has debt and China has debt, they're completely different types of debt. America hasn't taken that money invested in new productive systems to make it competitive in a new phase. It's invested it in keeping its status quo. Whereas China's invested in a totally new infrastructure, which has put them into a hugely challenging position. And, and on the subject of demographics, as you mentioned, it, it, according to your model, it is the key driver uh, to, to these empire uh, trends. How, how, do the, how do the demographic trends fare across all of the regions that you look at? I mean, West into Asia. So, so if you look at, for example, um, in Europe, Europe and the EU construct is doomed to failure because it has negative demographics in the core countries. There is no social structure I have ever encountered that can maintain itself with negative core demographics, which was the reason why I made a judgment that Europe was a fragile structure that would break and that when Britain was had the choice to leave, it should do because it was effectively leaving the Titanic on the first boat out rather than as everyone tried to pile into the boats. And I stand by that judgment today. In America, although there's a bigger population, the ratio of immigration and Mexicans to the indigenous core WASP construct that built the empire is shrinking massively. And that isn't about racism, it's about some collective engine. Once one of these cycles is started by a group and that group starts to contract, no amount of imports can do it. If you take Rome, for example, it pop its population in decline declined, so they had their barbarians in their army. They completely changed their social structure, but it didn't stop decline. In the end, those very barbarians took control of the, the emperor's, emperor's seat way before they were invaded from the outside. So you can't change the cycle by forced immigration. Now, when we come to China uh, and Japan, so Japan, for example, is the, the first of the, the super Asian nations, um, which kicked off, you know, 
really in the sort of 1880s, 1850s, after the Meiji uh, Restoration, which is its civil war of formation, essentially it has negative demographics. It's an old man. Now, it's an old man in a young system. So I always think of it as a you know 80 year old man taking steroids to go and run a marathon. It 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 will keep up. If you transplanted Japan into Europe, it would just collapse like the rest of Europe. But surrounded by younger energy, it's keeping it's keeping a position to maintain itself as an important counter to China. Now, China's demographics are looking pretty ugly going forwards, but that doesn't help us because the demographics that have powered this expansion are already there. And mainly there are 55% males, which is 4% higher than any other normal aggressive society, which means they've got 55 million men of risk capital that you could go to war with and lose and still be in an aggressive state. So we are looking at a society that I've never seen with such a testosterone governed process, which explains why they are so aggressive in their expansionary mechanism. They are literally crawling over the back of each other to get to that expansive moment. And it's something that we underestimate in the West and goes to the point that when we created a deterrence gap, it hasn't, the wall can't be the same as we used against the Soviets, who was an older empire as Europe. It has to be three times higher to deter their aggression. So there's a factor there just through demographics. It sounds simple, but it's incredibly profound in how it replicates through the strategy of containing China. And if I could add two other countries uh, to the list, I, I read in your notes, of course, uh, Britain uh, almost standing out uh, from the rest on the, in terms of uh, Western uh, uh, negative demographics and, and just general uh, divergences. And then also going East, India, um, as, as still being in the running, uh, but with a different uh, driver. What can you so, share on those two, two regions? So, so I'll go to India as, we're, as a continuation of Asia. And in India, the demographics are unbelievably powerful. And they place India 15 years behind China. Now, on the curve. So what that means if you're Xi, if you inherited the 50-year plan, which just started in 1996, so to come to fruition in 2046, you've got to get to your dominant position by 2030 because your demographics start to tail off on you. Their demographics keep expanding. And R Russia contained German strategic ambitions in World War I and World War II, because in World War I, Germany had to deal with an enemy in the East and an enemy in the West. And ultimately, it had to turn towards Russia with Stalin before it finished Britain off. So it changed the course of the war by the threat it posed as a dynamic challenger behind Germany. And India is exactly the same in forcing the time frame of China and Xi's expansion. And th so those demographics are very powerful. And India is interesting because India became a democracy through conditioning. I argue in my work later on that the difference between hierarchies and democracies, hierarchies are the standard human form of collective organization. So where do democracies come from? And quite simply, I argue that they came from societies that had that came from the sea, because the sea is an entropic environment. It creates lateral thinkers, because lateral thinkers are adapted to surviving at sea and thinking laterally. So whole communities became lateral on the coast. So countries with that depend on their sea tend to be lateral, and countries that are landlocked tend to be linear. Linear suits a hierarchy, and lateral suits a democracy. So Athens, for example, was a sea power, and it was no coincidence it was the seat of Western democracy. Britain, for example, led the democratic process, and its ratio of coastline to internal volume made it a very, very stark sea power. And so lateral and linear and environmental issues decide whether democracy works or not. So it's no coincidence that Russia and China, that are predominantly land systems with land people, operate hierarchies and democracy hasn't touched them because they're not genetically adapted to receive it. And that was the error we made going to Iraq. A landlocked country wasn't ready to accept democracy. And you can see a very interesting correlation between left-handed markers. And I talk about this in my later work. Asian societies have fewer left-handed people than Western democratic societies. So Britain might have 13 in America percent of marked left-handers. And as a marker of lateral people, they're an indicator of about 50% maybe 40%. So there are very few in Asia and they're far more collective. And the reason why Japan is a democracy in South Korea is mainly because of their exposure to the West post the Second World War and time showed them the way to do it. It's not a natural adaptation.
So this struggle between democracy and hierarchy is really about to be worked out in this conflict ahead. One works on the optimization of the individual to its maximum potential. The other works on lower potentials controlled from a central location and mass compensates for individual potential. And it's a fascinating evolutionary struggle we've had for centuries, but it's coming to a real head in this particular struggle. And circling back to the West, uh, you mentioned Britain oh, yes. as standing out from the rest. Uh, what so, can you share on, on Britain I mean, in terms of its economy, its demographics, but then also Brexit as a key moment in history? So this is interesting because all of my life, pretty much born in 63, I've lived in an environment where there was an embarrassment to be English after we lost an empire. We didn't focus on that it was the biggest empire in the world and, you know, the most effective global maritime system the world had ever seen. We, we lived in the world after we lost it. And, um, and so when I developed Breaking the Code of History, I assumed Britain was part of the European construct of decline, legacy, floating around. Uh, but I created a number of early warning markers, and one of them was the construct of expanding systems moving through the Olympic medal table. And if you look at the way the trajectory of expanding systems, which I call national, having national energy, national energy is aspiration. It's the ability to be competitive. It's the ability to harness money to create outcomes, which is why it isn't just a random activity. It's a, it's a real measure of national energy. And suddenly there was Britain with a third and second. And I almost fell off my chair because I realized I'd missed it. We had expanding demographics, partly through immigration, but they were highly integrative. And at the beginning of a cycle, regionalization can be powered by immigration. It's later on, you can't do it in decline, but at this stage, because it's integrative. So that ticked the box, national energy ticked the box. And then of course, there was this issue about pro-Europe, not Europe. Um, I knew that Europe was in the state of the Titanic post hitting the iceberg, just no one had noticed. So, so the moment I understood the Olympic dynamic, I understood that the energy that was expanded by UKIP was real. It wasn't just a fringe party. It was a core representation of the desire to leave the EU, to break away and adapt and expand faster. So I knew the referendum I actually predicted from that stage onwards, I used the model of a regional civil war. And it predicted every single step that the step that are basically the left, the left-brained linear thinkers would com be completely outclassed by the lateral challenge. And the lateral challenge of guerrilla actions, whether it was Nigel Farage, who interviewed me recently, and it was a really interesting interview because he's a very engaging man uh, in our discussions. And basically, Farage forced the Conservative Party to adapt. And in their adaptation, they then pulled the trigger and created the next stage. Now, there was an awful lot of good in that moment because the Brexit process was a regional civil war. And the only one I found in history that didn't cause blood to flow. So there is hope we can go through these social processes with the constraints of law and order and democracy containing that energy. That's the great news. But there's a massive downside, and that is by the end of a civil war, the whole of the challenging system thinks laterally. The army, the navy, the leaders, because they've been borne out through entropic conflict and just linear thinkers can't cope in that environment. So you end up with a highly adaptive, natural system that is expansive, and then it follows its resource change and it shoots out the gun in effect and starts to expand. If you take the time it took Britain to finish the English civil wars and go to war with the Dutch, it was just a matter of months, if not a few years, and it was off. We didn't complete that. So we ended up with a lateral leadership um, and Boris personifies lateral, but he doesn't have the discipline for the next stage. And a lateral group of Brexiteers, but a very linear governmental system and a very linear like leadership construct in civil society. So we, there's an internal revolution for Britain to go through if it's to really release itself, which is releasing that lateral energy through the system from the civil service and government. And I think that's to follow. And I think this year we'll see Boris be knocked off his horse and the replacement initiate that process. And if that happens, watch out, because then I think Britain will, will start to really leap forwards and manifest the, the expansion to empire, expansion to the next phase. Being two Brits, and I've just relocated from uh, West to East, it's great to hear the, uh, uh, well, that story and, and certainly what it means uh, for the future and how things aren't necessarily one size fits all for the West, 
Um, uh, and and uh, of course, there are differences within Asia as well. And actually, on that point, David, if you could re-clarify your definition of a super empire, because this took me a while to to think about in terms of timelines, but also subtle differences. So, so before I do that, because a great question, I'm going to go back one. Actually, I think Brexit was much more important, important than people realize for the whole world, for the democratic world, because in the process of going through it, it affirmed the values of democracy. Now, within Europe, democracy has died under the EU construct of the commission. It isn't there anymore, and it it, 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 it is planned to be eradicated. Democracy is fail, failing in America under the fracturing process. So you have at least one country in the Western system that's firmly like expansive in mindset. And the idea of global Britain is a paper tiger at the moment because we don't have the armed forces to protect our resource chains, but it's an aspiration that's real. And with that aspiration comes the affirmation of Western democracy. So I see that special relationship that was very much an excuse of a junior Britain to an all dominant America. There's a power shift coming, which America is not prepared for, which was Britain actually starting to help America in a Zimmer frame navigate through some of the challenges. And we saw it when the WHO lost their funding by Trump. Britain was the first to step in and offer that funding gap to be filled. So I think that the, the Brexit represents a very important part of the hope in confronting and hopefully containing this massive challenge from China and its opportunistic partner, Russia. So going very back to the next question. Um, yes, super so, empire. OK, so, so em these empire systems are really organizational mechanisms. And of course, as the population has got bigger, so has the need to organize bigger systems. So it's quite natural that, in fact, instead of bonding a group of people by their national identifier, you bond them by their religious meme, because a religious meme like Christianity is bigger than a national border. So if you look at the super Western Christian empire, as I call it, its phase in regionalization was Catholic. Its civil war of regionalization was the Lutheran war that started between Protestants and Catholics. And interestingly enough, the countries like Holland and Britain that became Protestant, that released their ties between God's control over thought and became directly linked themselves, had a completely different perspective of the world. They were able to question and with question, they were able to create. So this, this religious revolution begat the Protestant world that was the expansive engine of the super Western Christian empire. And so then all the expansion really took place as a Protestant system because Britain predominantly dominated that process after the Dutch failed. And the British Empire that dominated the world was the representation of the super Western Christian Empire's power. Now, uh, decline is very interesting because decline also, so when you look at the rise of the Communist Party, communists were atheists. So what they were really saying was, no, we're not part of the Western Christian Empire. We're not part of Christianity. We are atheists. And that's how the system split in Russia. And it did it in a fascinating way because then it gave it definition. It's no longer the same. Therefore, it could polarize and therefore it could compete. And then along came Nazi socialism, which is another atheist system. So now in that split to the right of not Christian, you had this struggle between communism and atheism in Nazi socialism. And it started in the Spanish Civil War with the fascists versus the communists, and it went through to the Second World War. And it's a reason why it was such a tenacious, horrendous conflict in the Eastern Front is there were no certain moral constraints from a religious perspective of a higher level. And they were two expanding systems, literally fighting tooth and nail. And without the Soviets, we wouldn't have won the Second World War. We could not have contained the energy of Germany one way or the other. And so what happened at the end of the Second World War is you're left with two halves of an empire, one, the residual of the Western Christian world, and the other, the communist USSR. And in, in Asia, you're looking at a region that essentially occupied a process, starting with the Japanese, who gained equality and respect as an equals to the West, hard fought, hard won. Now the Chinese follow and the Indians will follow that. So three systems that echo the multiple systems that we saw as Britain became the dominant system in the world. So really important to understand the, uh, I mean, the evolution of empires, the, the different types, and certainly the distinction between, let's say, a traditional one and a super 
uh, um, rising uh, power. I, I noticed, um, of course, you know, it, in the mainstream last year, there was talk of the the, the uh, new century of of Asia, uh, specifically focusing on on GDP figures. I think for the first time in a long time, um, Asia had had surpassed. So I, we've looked at markets. We've looked at, I mean, demographics being central trend. Um, uh, markets economy. Uh, how about the work of Nikolai Kondratiev, the long wave and commodity markets and what that means, I mean, for inflation, but then also for social unrest and conflict? So, uh, as you know, we've talked about as a case cycle, as I call it, is this something I've included in my work. And I recognize it's Kondratiev's work. And the best exponent of that work is, I believe, Tony Plummer, a great, old, a great friend. And uh, some of his work on this is just truly off the charts. But the thing that attracted me to it was, if you look at us, we, we're talking about the social system, we're talking about competition between social systems. And what I became interested in is, why, when and why do they go to war? Well, it's very simple. Systems go to war for resources. They use religious memes and national memes to justify why they should go to war. So in fact, what we call religious wars are not religious wars, they're resource wars using religion as the motivating polarizing factor. Once you start to realize that, you've got to look at the commodity cycle. And if you look at Kondratius observations and their 54-year cycles, at the peak of those cycles, there are major conflicts. The American Civil War, 1914, the peak of the, 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 the Vietnam War, and our next one, which I highlighted since I started talking about this in 2001, is basically 2025 and the peak of this next Kondratius cycle. Now, I've followed the Kondratius cycle as a risk taker very closely and i've developed some of my own versions of it and it really works so we picked up the beginning of this cycle in 2000 um it's fascinating you know i can remember buying luke all at 64 cents and selling it a few years later for 64 dollars just as every trading desk were putting in their pension fund didn't want that and of course that was a high um and so the first surge of this recent cycle was into 2011 commodities did it in different peaks the counter surge has been 2011 to 2020, and we are now in what is really the C wave. And that C wave is frightening because if you look at 1914, that peak is quite high or as high as any peak because it's two consuming empires, Germany versus Britain, that basically competed for resources. And you know what happened, the price went up. And when it went to a certain stage, resource conflict triggered action. In the Vietnam War, something different happened. The peak was lower. And in the Cold War, you had a commodity producer, Russia, and you had a commodity consumer, the West. So in fact, you didn't have two consumers, you had a producer and a consumer. And, and I have modeled the whole Cold War on one Kondratiev cycle, the beginning of the 50s and the dominance and rise of communism and its threat. And the reason why its economy looked like it was working is they were a, they were a commodity producing society. In, in, in the opposite, the consumer societies of the West suffered from higher and higher inflation as commodity prices went higher. And the result in the 75 was that was the point when it looked like they were unstoppable. It looked like inflation was killing our economies off. It was a nightmare for the West. And actually, it was a pretty cool running for, for the USSR at the time. And interesting enough, the resurgence of Russia under Putin started at the beginning of this Kondratiev cycle. So the conclusion is we really need to make friends with Putin now. Because in about a year and a year and a half, his commodity pricing, if he's pissed off with the West, as he is, has done, and I've written pieces about he is not our enemy, and I don't think the West treated them in the same way that the Marshall Plan treated J Japan and Germany, America run roughshod over the top of a proud nation. So we made this problem ourselves. We shouldn't be in Ukraine. And because there's a whole history around how Obama was upset about the chemical red line in Syria, Ukraine is not a strategic point that we should be defending, but we should be also be using it to trade in such a way as we bring Russia on side to surround China. Because I'm sure that Russia doesn't want to be left holding the world after a successful world war with just China knowing it's next. So that's always the play to have. But in terms of this Kondratiev cycle, when people talk about is inflation real, there are three sources of inflation that we see right now. So from 2000 onwards, the general inflationary dynamics of our economies were suppressed by exporting manufacturing to the low cost Chinese system. We were being duped in the process by a very cunning plan 
where they knew they were pretending that they would look like us if we invested in them. All they wanted was our investment, our IP, and for us to build the biggest manufacturing base in the world and put ourselves out of business because that gave them a strategic advantage in an arms race. And we were duped intentionally. They didn't change their minds. They didn't take a course. There's very clear evidence they planned to dupe us. And so in that process, we created lower inflation across the past two parts of the Kondratiev cycle. Now we moved into the really powerful C wave, the lid's off. Input prices triggered this recognition of the fear of inflation. We now have supply constraints, which I think are really all about China moving to an internally fueled consumer society, not exporting anymore and the choke points that go with it. And at the same time, it's shifted into a Nazi four-year plan type mobilization where it's preparing for conflict. So we're not going to get supply chains to work out of China. Increasingly, they're going to be squeezed. And if China has a go at Taiwan, the door shuts firmly. So that inflationary pressure is with us through thick and thin. And the last and the biggest one is the buildup of the printing of money. And of course, empires get away with it until they don't. Suddenly, the rose-colored glasses fall off and the amount of debt becomes apparent. And the fact you've devalued your currency through printing is really clear. And those last two things, even if we get a collapse of equity markets, which I think we're going to see in 22, probably the biggest collapse in history, you're still going to have underlying inflation as you land. So stagflation, the destruction of real growth, that's what 22 has in store for us. It's a nasty cocktail. And, and on that point, I mean, it, it, key things for us to watch out for in the new year, certainly um, across the board. Uh, I mean, here at the Foundation of Study of Cycles, we're clearly big believers in the study of cycles and, and, and much of the work that we're discussing now. Um, on occasion, we find pushback with the long cycles, partly because they are so long, and then also because, of course, the uh, factors that can happen over time. What do you say to people that that push back and 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 talk about you know, external factors exogenous shocks can it break the cycle can it change the cycle what's your view so i come from this as a ex-geophysicist and you know someone who's studied extensively plate tectonics and the idea that two plates sit for hundreds of years and nothing happens and you can spend you know three generations sitting on the top of one of those tectonic fault lines and suddenly underneath you, all of the pressure that's been building that you didn't see is released. Your house goes, your family disappears just in an instant. And tectonic stresses and pressure releases are exactly the same as geopolitical empire cycles. So just because it took a long time to build to get to this point in the decline of the super Western Christian empire of which America is the last of the empires and the rise of the super Asian empire, which China is the second. And now, you know, almost 120 years since it started its own cycle doesn't mean the release point isn't now and truly significant. So that's my argument about it's not a linear release. It's a huge energetic total release. And can you afford to not be aware of those points? No, you can't, because if you're in business, you get wiped out. Um, and then I'm always interested in the markers, which why now? What are the evidence around us? Um, and interesting enough, I think that the evidence of shocks that are coming down the track for the Western world are irrefutable. The trouble is, um, is that America's defense mechanism, like any empire before, has been to print money. If you print money, you look competitive. Started off probably in 01, 03, three times. By the time you got to the bottom of 08, 10 times. And by the end of this, 40 times, which means if they tell you you're growing 4%, you're actually growing 0.1% of real growth. And the thing that just amazes me is no one says, so could you give me the real growth numbers pre the printing of money after you've created the leveraged effects? You would ask that in a leveraged fund. No one does about economies which shows you just how useless a thought process is, because I think you'll find America's real growth is minuscule, which means it's very susceptible to losing 0.1 of real growth and 40 times leverage just collapses. And I think that's where it's destined. Now, the problem we've got is that by printing money, you create dopamine in a bubble. And this super doomsday bubble, as I call it, has literally poured dopamine into the populations, financial populations. It's created the biggest beta trend we've ever seen. That's filtered out any alpha trader who wants to go against it, just has been wiped out. 
all the intuitive people that would pick highs. There's no reward in that process. So you now have a system that's aligned to the beta mindset of a linear thought. And believe me, they're the last people that can see an entropic shock coming. So I'll give you an example. Um, I, in Breaking the Code of History, there's a whole sector in the relationship of diseases and the cycles of empires. And I made a prediction that the next pandemic would come from a Chinese military weapons laboratory as a product of seeking asymmetric advantage through biological weapons development. So when Wuhan started to appear on my radar screen, which was in December, my ears really pricked up and I did a lot of work. By the time the Taiwanese shut their gates on the 5th of January, everyone in the West should have been thinking the people who know the Chinese best, who had the experience of SARS-1, are the Taiwanese, and they're shutting their gates. Why aren't we? So I was able to warn every investor that I um, provide um, services and advice to on the 6th of January that a global pandemic was coming. We also coupled it with the near end cycle price wise of a market that was completely deluded in terms of at that stage. What amazed me was how slow people were to recognize the reality of the entropic shock. And that is very much a product of the bubble creating dopamine and the, and the construct of the bubble filtering out the lateral alpha generators, replacing them with trend followers who believe the Fed would underpin every dip. It's certainly interesting times and, and wonderful to hear your description from a behavioral uh, perspective in terms of how, how bubbles are created and, and ultimately how they end with the burst. Looking out into the new year of 2022, David, what do you see for markets? I mean, certainly for many of our members, uh, a, a, a growing number of them are from the investment community. What would be your guidance for global multi-asset markets? So... Um... If there's one strategy which I would commit my resources to, it's precious metals, whether it's gold, silver, platinum, especially the mining companies associated with them. I have very specific strategies. Um, my entrance, I, I might have long-term horizons, but I have very, very precise short-term entry points. So I'm able to find the lows of cycles and risk $20 and run them for hundreds. And that's, you know, the, that's where I think the real art of investment is, is short term entry points are the super tight to critical moments. Once you're in them, you recognize that you're in actually a much bigger trend. You have your risk controls that run with it, but you risk small amounts for multiples. For example, in the Turkish lira, we managed to make 70 times our return, literally by entering and running the trade to the appropriate spike. And actually, we got out of the spike and we bought the recent low. So, I mean, it's all about how you set up your trading mechanisms. So so I do think that we're going to see a massive equity bubble burst. And I think the consequences are going to be horrendous financially in terms of the amount of cortisol that flows through the American system. The speed at which that cortisol channels itself into recognizing the Chinese threat is going to surprise everyone. It's going to be like clicking your fingers partly because the two things might co coincide around Taiwan, but even if they're separate, it'll be cortisol in the American population, not dopamine. I think the dollar is pretty much finished and about to embark on a really, it's been going down for 20 years and it has an incredible wave count. So we're in the fifth wave and I can see 30 to 40% coming off it in that fifth wave over the next year to two years. And I think we're close to an acceleration. And one pair that is very clearly does that is against the Chinese currency. You can see that hegemonic shift in terms of that thing doesn't even correct. It just you know keeps sitting at the bottom of its trend. Strangely enough, I think sterling is going to be the one currency safe haven. Um, and, and the reason I think it's so is separateness from Europe, its underlying growth dynamics, the separateness of the BOE is beginning to show in terms of recognizing inflation. And I think that the government will finally work out that a low tax regime will attract all the capital from Europe and America, and they won't have to print any money to actually hold the system up. So I think as we see we see this crisis unfold, it'll dawn on the conservatives that they should actually go to you know um, Singapore and Thames, and we will see that out of desperation in the end. In terms of so precious metals, sterling is a safe haven. Dollar starting to move. That there is a demand collapse around the commodity cycle, which is a wave two. Wave one was off the lows of 2020. There is a clear five wave impulse across the whole sector. We're in a deep wave two, and it could be pretty deep if we have an asset price collapse in equities, which I think seems absolutely inevitable. Um, and with it, we're going to see some major issues around 
ongoing inflation despite that process, population screaming in the cost of living, and politicians having a very difficult time, you know, not being the brunt of the focus of the cost of living problem. Um, and at the same time, we need to mobilize against China. And I can see Taiwan being a problem. I can see uh, there is a rapprochement between America and Russia, which right now we're going to lose the Ukraine. We can't defend it. We'll lose it. And there's, if you understand Russian geostrategy, it's like taking the Isle of Wight off them. You can't do that. And we shouldn't be there. So it's a question of how we actually trade that place and make it neutral and give or create an entente cordiale with Russia. Now, I don't trust Biden to be able to do this, but this is what you should be doing, is basically drawing Russia away from China. And you can use two arguments. One is the pandemic was not natural. It was an intentional release. And you're supposed to be an ally of China and you suffered. So how do you feel about that? And the other one is how do you feel when you won World War Three with your ally China and you're next? And both of those parameters are similar strategic positions that Stalin found himself in. And ultimately, the West allied with Stalin against Germany. I can see the same dynamic with Russia. So there's something to be had there. If we don't do it, then an invasion of the Ukraine will precipitate Taiwan and a nuclear Iran and an issue around nuclear weapons probably being released by Israel all in one go. So we face a barrage of crisis. And I don't think Biden is a linear thinker and as a young man, he wasn't up to the job. As an old man, he really shouldn't be in the seat. And he endangers our whole Western society as this you know, increased entropic challenge is, is upon us. So certainly it's very difficult. And the other thing is, I think the pandemic is over. I predicted back in uh, November that Omicron was the fourth attenuated wave that inoculated people, didn't put them in hospital. And essentially, this whole Western response of we know what to do, lockdowns work. Well, lockdowns are a fascinating study of collective behavior because none of the curves of distribution have been changed by any of the interventions by government, if you use Sweden as a bellwether. So you can see the first time they didn't know what to do, the second time they thought about it, the third time they definitely knew, the fourth time, of course, everyone who's linear thinker knows what you do. And of course, the threat wasn't commensurate with the actions. So th that's a fascinating sort of example in the real world of what we see in a bear market or a correction where everyone is super bearish at the bottom of the correction or super bullish at the top. It's well, it's the correction model, really. And that's where it's fascinating. Once you start to understand how markets have a psychology linked to price, you can start to see those in real world activities which don't have a price, but you do see the psychology. So despite some of the crisis management ahead there is a, a silver lining uh, that we we can also keep in our radar and, and and one point david if i may on the subject of currencies which to some is a race to the bottom in terms of uh, you know, all, all the money printing and, and the credit mismanagement what do you say on the point of currency play in general and this whole sh potential alternative uh, to a, a different form of money. Some people cite crypto, others suggest uh, maybe something hard back like gold. What's your view on that subject? So we are, we are at a time, we're in the fifth wave of the decline of the dollar as a hegemonic currency. So the questions of what do I do with my money are very appropriate. Well, would you really want to give your money to Chinese and CCP control? Although they are becoming the hegemonic currency of replacement, it's not something that I would really be drawn to. So we can cross that off the list. So we're left with gold and silver, which I advocate very strongly. But there's obviously this rise with the blockchain concept of cryptocurrencies. And I think they represent the construct of substitution. Now, I think they are flawed because quantum computers will break blockchains. So this is not a long-term solution. This is a short-term, what do we do? The difficulty is, is that if you take Bitcoin as an example, Bitcoin is not a store of value. And when it was up at 69 and everyone was super bullish and I was listening to people tell me it was going to 250, I put the short out at 68. Tight stop, not more than a couple of hundred, expecting to go sub 30 because we're in a fourth wave and it's a B wave irregular. And it's proven to be the perfect count. So that implies that Bitcoin will go sub 30, probably not below 20. Everyone will get thoroughly and utterly sick holding it. And that's when you might find the counter surge up to 100 because there's still a fifth wave to come. So think of it more as a very speculative dynamic. And most people are going to have a very, very difficult ride if you don't understand your price patterns. Uh, and, and there was another piece you touched on, which I, I did want. To, one of the, there was a reason, there are some reasons why I wrote Breaking the Code of History. Um, I wrote it 
mainly because I was a CEO of a hedge fund and it was my investment thesis. That was its origins. But I quickly realized that I'd stumbled upon something that you couldn't keep to yourself, that needed to be shared, mainly that we are seeing the decline of a Western system at a point and the rise of China and the Eastern system at a Kondratiev peak, which will bring World War III. And so the warning that we are walking and have been all the way along to that point where we, where China believes it's possible to win a war and initiates it is more real than ever. Now, um, there's an awful lot of work I've done to explain that every expansive system for 120 years, including America, so democracy doesn't stop this process, expands by going to war. So China would be the exception, and especially the exception with 55% males when the others had 51. So my conclusion is we face a point where we will either go to war and the West will lose and democracy will be eradicated, or we face a point where we destroy ourselves, where warfare is too destructive. Now you can see in the Chinese strategy, they're trying to find a way of winning a war with an open strike. So they don't want to go and commit suicide. They're trying to find ways of winning that war totally with minimal su suffering to themselves, which is very scary because it makes them think they can fight that war. And if they're opening gambit doesn't work, then you know what you end up with, a nutritional struggle and the destruction of mankind. So the other thing that I really wanted to talk about is if you take an alcoholic or someone that has a pattern of behavior, once they're aware of it, that's 51% of the problem. Then you can decide how you go next. The problem for mankind is we're not aware that the whole of our history is based on a collective unconscious cycle of behavior patterns. And only from the world of finance, where we can quantify price and link it to emotions, do we ever have a chance to explain to the rest of our populations that we are all captured by this unconscious process. So cycles and the study of cycles and unconscious collective behavior is really the only way mankind is going to find a better, more constructive way out of this. So cycle work is, is of paramount importance because it is the mirror that reflects human history and our collective limitations. And I think we have reached the limitation of our expansion this decade. This isn't something for our children. This isn't something that we can go to bed and say, that's interesting. What are we going to buy for Christmas? Or, you know, this is something that is on our watch that we need to be aware of. And, and I always thought that I would start with the financial sector because we see everyone knows the recycles in finance and we are a highly educated group of people. And from there it would spread out. But sadly, our study of cycles hasn't got outside our profession. And that really does have to change. And, and on that point, uh, David, the uh, subject of Arkent Roadmap, if, if you could share uh, its purpose and, and uh, benefits to all. So um, as, uh, as a CIO years ago, I used to create roadmaps. You know, how did I see these cycles interact with each other and affect different asset classes? And how did I want to navigate through them to maximize returns? So, of course, you know, old habits return, but, you know, after gaps, it's amazing how something happened in the space that I didn't study markets because I started in 86. And so then I continuously took risk all the way through to 2013. And then from 13 to 19, I literally stepped away. And what was fascinating is having stepped away and come back, it's almost as if something matured in between. And so this roadmap um, dictated the move from what I saw was the last move upwards in European markets. I didn't never, I never saw, and I'll come on to that, but it was basically the last in the European peaks into the peak from the pandemic. Then the first down, which was the shock, the correction, which I think we've completed in Europe, and then an impulse to new lows. And all the European um, equity markets look like they have been going sideways for 20 years. Make no mistake, they're nothing like America. They're really waiting for the shoe to drop or the system's going to collapse. So I could see that in Europe and something similar in America. I did not anticipate that in what was a correction for Europe would turn to a primary like bubble in the US. In my wildest dreams, I did not think they could inflate like this. So the size of the bubble in America has caught me by surprise. And that's the only piece of it that really was a surprise. All the other parts, the behavior of the asset classes and groups, which is in the three phases of the ARCA map, we're in phase three right now, the point where the dollar, ultimately bonds and equities all go down together, where inflation has taken hold, where precious metals are the only safe place. 
and another whole construct geopolitically, which I articulate. So it's about expectations versus reality and looking for those signs coinciding. And they're there and they're, they're happening right in front of us. So as we complete this wonderfully, I, I think, inspiring is, is the word that comes to mind, discussion, of course, that there are checkpoints that we need to keep in mind. And there's certain research that I think uh, many of our audience will, will likely dive into as well uh, following. I'd like to touch on a quote uh, that I found in your work um, and share your insights on this. Uh, so if I, if I read it verbatim, all this happened before and will happen again, unless we choose to consciously change our collective patterns of empire. And, and on that very poignant quote, what are your thoughts? Well, again, I mentioned about um, the release of essentially cycles which have governed human expansion. And in my recent theory of human anti-entropy, I started to understand why we created social systems. So our survival strategy to hold back the entropy of the universe is to create social coherence, which allows us to order our universe around us and push back entropic effects, which is essentially how we get our DNA to, to continue. So the more coherence and more technology, longer lived, you know, preserved against most disasters, trying to work out how to stop an asteroid hitting us. They're all the evolutions of this chain of the control of the entropic universe in, a, in an island or bastion, which is anti-entropic. We've done that, and, and empires represent the social ordering of that strategy at the highest level. At the peak of an empire, they're most productive and most anti-entropic. At the trough of an empire, they become actually subject to entry because they're not very creative anymore, which is why if you look at the effects of the pandemic, it's affected the Western world far more than the Eastern world, something I predicted back in Breaking the Code of History. Declining systems can't adapt and resist that energy and that change quickly. So the anti-entropy theory talks about how we've created empires and why. But this process of removing the old decaying system is going to lead to ultimate demise. So first, we've got to realize how and why we got to this point, recognize that we're governed by a collective unconscious behavioral pattern that, by the way, has an ability to forget its collective actions because we have no part of an individual's brain that can store a collective behavioral emotion. That's why we don't identify we're part of it. And so and then we encourage our leadership, first of all, and our people to recognize the options if we carry on doing the unconscious things versus the conscious things. And I think that's the biggest part of the gift of cycles outside the people that are interested because they harness them for markets. It's basically about shaping policy using history. Now, the Chinese are very interesting because they respect history more than any other society, perhaps Britain. We don't learn from it. They learn from it. So their strategy is the most sophisticated I have ever seen. It's multi-layered. It's terrifying, but it befits a country that recognizes the lessons of the past. His, history in Britain is really valued. And I think Britain's role in this is huge because, A, that we don't have any embarrassing moments like the French, which we kind of black out, or any other nation like Germany. We're, we're proud of most of our history within the human construct, which means it's continuous and it's respected. So I think Britain is a real candidate for starting that change. In America, they don't even respect their own history. It's so short, they don't see the pattern of it. So I think it's hard to get Americans to understand that actually they should learn from the lessons of the British Empire because most of them didn't really know how big it was and had no idea of its role. So their lack of global education makes it hard to see that. So I think Britain is actually a primary place to start this process and spread it outwards. But we've got to do it quickly. And we've got to learn that basically the only way you, you face down an aggressor is not by appeasing it, it's by creating full spectrum deterrence with the intention to use it. And all predators then back away with that risk. Once we've backed the CCP down, then we can start to have a conversation about what comes next. And that's the back end of the commodity cycle. So that's the upside of what I would like to see happen. I'm just rather concerned at how asleep we all are as a collective, it's beginning to change. But the role of cycles and the work the foundation has done, I think, needs to get much further out than just the financial sphere of interest. And, and on that very uh, positive note for the study of cycles and then the future ahead, David Murren, thank you so much uh, on behalf of the Foundation on Study of Cycles and uh, really appreciate this discussion with Cycle TV.
Ron, it's a great pleasure to be to be grilled by you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I hope, hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. I have I've loved it. I look forward to the next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>